Hitting a baseball is the hardest thing to do in all of sports. The act of simply putting the bat on the ball is an amazing feat. But the worst part about it all is the fact that you can square up a ball perfectly and it can still be an out. Because of this, there are a few metrics out there that help us understand which players are getting lucky and which players aren't. And today, you're going to learn all about them. But before we jump into it guys, if you enjoy the content you're seeing on this channel and you want to continue to see more of it, it'd mean a lot if you'd click that subscribe button. I'm a numbers guy, and only about 30% of the people who watch these videos are actually subscribed. So show your support by clicking the subscribe button down below. When understanding a player's luck, you can really break it down into three separate categories. Hard hit outs, park factors, and expected versus actual performance. Starting with hard hit outs. This is a pretty obvious and easy metric to analyze. No matter how hard a ball is hit, if it's hit right at somebody, it's going to be an out. If a hitter has a high percentage of outs on balls hit with above a 95 mile per hour exit velocity, you can gather that they are currently getting unlucky at the plate. We looked at a perfect example of this in a video a few weeks ago surrounding Yasmani Grandal's performance this year. He ranks in the 94th percentile in hard hit percentage, but his batting average is below 200. That means that even though he puts the ball in play hard quite often, he is rarely rewarded with a hit, and he's getting out more than the average player does on balls put in play. Then of course there are park factors. To oversimplify what this means, imagine a fly ball hit deep in the outfield. In this park, this is most likely caught by the right fielder. However, if the outfield fence were right here, it would be a home run. Now of course this is an extreme example, and there's a ton more that goes into park factors but the idea is a ball put in play at one stadium does not always lead to the same results as a ball put in play with the same metrics at another. And as these trends build over time, we can begin to classify which stadiums are hitters parks and pitchers parks. And in the main scheme of things, this matters a ton because a hitter who spends half of his games at Coors Field is going to perform better than someone who plays all of his home games at Yankee Stadium. If you're analyzing hitters for park factors, another good metric to check out is the percentage of outs on barrels. Most of the time, this correlates with having a pitcher's park. Then we have expected versus actual performance. This is what we are going to spend most of our time talking about in today's video. If you look up the statistical leaders on Baseball Savant, you'll notice a column at the end that says WOBA, expected WOBA, and then tells you the difference between the two. In this example, you can see that this top hitter would be quite unlucky because his actual performance, his WOBA, is quite lower than his expected performance, X WOBA. These stats often cover the other two situations that we talked about, so it's my first place to look when I'm analyzing which players may be underperforming or overperforming. Let's dive into how you can do that. In order to understand the difference between WOBA and X WOBA, let's first review what each metric is defining. WOBA is a catch-all statistic used to analyze a hitter's offensive value by weighting every single outcome that can occur. Here is the formula for the 2021 season, and if this looks confusing, I did a whole video breaking this stat down in the past. Link in the description down below. Then, whenever you see a stat that starts with the letter X, like X WOBA, you know that we are dealing with an expected statistic. To calculate this, these portions are going to stay the same, but our singles, doubles, triples, and home runs turn into the expected number of singles, doubles, triples, and home runs based off of the batted ball data for our hitter. Let's go through a quick example to understand this better. This is a commonly used graphic to understand what combinations of exit velocity and launch angle make up different batted ball results. Each color represents a different outcome, and as you can see, they typically follow an easy to see trend. Now to our example. If we had a ball hit within 100 mile per hour exit velocity, and a 30 degree launch angle, we can gather from our chart that it would end up right about here, in the purple. And purple represents a home run. Great! That would be our expected outcome based on the past batted ball data. But that doesn't mean that's what actually happened. This could be played in a huge park with the wind blowing in or any other number of factors could affect our outcome here. Unfortunately for our hitter, this play actually resulted in an out. Whether it was caught on the warning track, or an outfielder made a spectacular catch up the wall, it really doesn't matter. When these two results are not the same, that is when our actual versus expected statistics become so important. Especially if a hitter has a long streak of unlucky outcomes compared to what has happened in the past. Of course, teams who value this information have complex machine learning programs analyzing all of this stuff in the background. 
but hopefully this example showed you what these stats mean. And of course, armed with this information, we can now dive into what hitters have been unlucky or lucky up until the All-Star break this season. To dive into this, we will start with our top 5 unluckiest hitters. The way we will do this is by comparing our WOBA, our ex-WOBA, and the difference between the two will define who is getting the unluckiest. All of this information can be found on Baseball Savant. I'll link it down below. Coming in at number 5, we have Alex Kirloff of the Minnesota Twins. His current WOBA is about average, actually, which is about 314 so far this year. But based on his batted ball metrics, he's someone who should be performing much above average. Then we have Chad Pinder of the A's coming in at number 4. His numbers look a little different than Kirloff's in the sense that his WOBA is currently below average, but his expected WOBA is actually above average. Next up is Matt Carpenter of the Cardinals, who is in a similar boat to Pinder, and in the two spot we have a Braves player who got himself into some trouble this year, so we won't spend too much time on him. And finally, the unluckiest player in 2021 up until this point would be David Bodie. Bodie's incredible difference of 81 points is actually insanely unlucky. Looking at only our top five here, he has the second lowest WOBA and the second highest expected WOBA. That's an unreal difference. Typically we can expect these numbers to even out over time and become closer together. So you can expect all of these hitters to hopefully improve their numbers in the second half of the season this year. But there's also always two sides to every coin. These players are being hurt by the baseball gods, while others are benefiting from them. So let's take a look at 2021's luckiest players so far. The top five luckiest players so far this season include Tony Kemp in the five spot, Ronald Torres in the four spot, Tucker Barnhart in the three spot, and Nick Madrigal in the two spot. Our luckiest player of the year so far is Joey Wendell. You can tell looking at these numbers just how unlucky David Bodie is getting, since the difference between his expected and actual stats are almost 20 points higher than the next unluckiest player, or the luckiest player. Looking at both of these charts, you can expect the players on the right to have less fortunate outings moving into our second half, aka they're due for regression, while hopefully our players on the left can have a little more luck come their way. Now, I've referred to these athletes as lucky and unlucky this whole time, but something that affects this a lot is the shift, because players who are often shifted in an extreme way may be recorded as less fortunate than others, and players who may not be shifted correctly may be actually benefiting from that. Just a thought for you to take with you before we wrap up today's video. So what are my main takeaways from today's video? Well, on the surface, if you're watching every single game of one of your favorite players, you may think that they're performing well while they are actually really just due for a regression. Expected versus actual stats typically even out over time. And when you look into the core of a team's lineup, in general, they should be pretty similar. The benefit of this stat is being able to understand that a player who is performing well may be benefiting from outside factors. And the exact opposite scenario can be true as well. This is yet another great tool to add to your toolbox when analyzing your favorite players. Thanks for tuning in to today's video, guys. If you enjoyed, please hit that subscribe button. If you want to keep learning more, here's a video and a playlist that I think you'd enjoy checking out. I'll catch you in the next one.